Uh, it's pretty incredible to see, right, God working all across the world, you know, and see little kids learning about Jesus on the good news, right? He said, right, it's going to go to the ends of the earth, and it is, uh, and uh, it's still continuing. People haven't heard about Jesus yet who need to hear, and uh, thank God for our missionaries who have heard the call, and they've, they've walked in the call, and they're reaching people um, who don't know, and so we got to continue to pray and lift them up and support them. And uh, I'm excited to be able to share with you guys. Um, it's always uh, a joy to be able to uh, share God's word and to read together. And uh, I just felt like uh, I actually changed my message. And I f- I'm really, I, f- uh, I feel so blessed. Like this was a word that I needed to hear uh, this week and this season. And I think as well as our church. And it's nothing new. Um, it's living in the spirit is, is my title. And, and this, this idea of, really having the power of the Holy Spirit in our everyday lives. And uh, I, I just feel it's a word for us. It's a word for me, for sure. And we're going to be in Acts chapter 2 as well as Galatians chapter 5. And the verses for Acts is going to be, uh, if you're going to jump there, is um, 2, 1 through 13. We're going to go there first, and then we'll go to Galatians 5, um, 16 through 25. And uh, as I was thinking about this idea of being empowered by the Spirit, living with the Spirit, um, walking by the Spirit, I, I, was, I was thinking of this, uh, this time, me and my brother, when I was just started driving, we were driving across um, Fairhaven Bridge. We went across the bridge, and you know how once you get in New Bedford, if you keep going straight, you go up this little hill, and it hits a stop sign, or uh, I mean a stoplight. And uh, every time, I'm never hitting a green light there. You got to stop. And so one time, uh, it, was the, it was winter, dead of winter, and I was driving this, my first, uh, tr- my first car. I had this awesome little pickup truck. Uh, it was actually Pastor Joe's before it was mine. And um, it was two-wheel drive, and I never put any weight in the back. And so, so me and my brother were driving, dead of winter, snows on the ground. Right? I think it was snowing at the time. And it started to get compact, even turning into ice. And so we started to go up this, up this uh, hill, and I'm like, please, please, red, please be green, please be green. And it's red. It was red. So we get, we get to the hill. I have to hit the brakes. And now I'm like, okay. And it was a stick shift, too. And I just remind you, I just started driving. So it was like maybe two, three months in. So I got my foot on the clutch. I'm waiting. I'm revving the engine. I'm ready to go, right? And, and as, soon as, um, as soon as it turned green, I'm like, okay. I jump off the clutch, hit the gas. And uh, we start to turn, but my wheels start spinning. And there's tons of cars behind me, tons. So my wheels start spinning. I'm like, oh, no. And not only did they start spinning, but as the wheels were turning, the, the truck started to go, roll backwards, right? So now we're, go, we're coming down the hill, cars behind me. I'm gunning the gas. Nah, that's not what you do. But my, uh, my brother, my, I'm like, Freddie, you got to hop out, dude. Yeah, you got to hop out. I need you to push, push this truck up the hill, right? <laughs> And my brother's strong, man. Thank God for my brother. My brother's strong and a big football player. And he, he jumps out, right, and uh, lines of cars behind us. And only person in front of them is my brother pushing a truck up a hill, right? Only hope they have. And uh, so I'm hitting the gas, and Freddie is p- walking this truck up the hill, right? And he pushed me all the way to the top, and then he ran around, jumped in the car, and we, and we, and we kept going. And I was thinking how there's no way I would have got up that hill by myself, right? And there's moments in life, many moments, probably moments we don't even realize I could never get through on my own. There's no way in my own strength, under my own foot, that I would be able to push this car up a hill. There's no way I'm going to be able to do what I need in my family, in my church, in my home, in my school, on my job, in my own heart, in my own mind. I'm never going to be able to do what I need to do on my own. I need help. I need help. And I think uh, it's always been the plan of God that his presence would be our help. And so we're going to jump into Acts chapter 2. And where did it begin? Where, where, Where did it begin where the Holy Spirit entered into the scene? Well, it began all the way in creation. And, and we saw, uh, we saw how, how uh, he, cre- he helped create the, the earth, right? He was hovering over the waters. But, but when did it begin that people were empowered by the Spirit to live? With that, that they had the presence of God in their every day, and, and they, could, they could walk with them and be strengthened? Well, if this was a, 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 a superhero movie, 
Acts chapter two is the origin story for how the church got its power, for how the church uh, uh, was able to begin the, this new beginning. And, and so when we look at Acts chapter two, Jesus has died, he has risen, he has met with the, with the, the disciples and the, and the other followers and, and the 500 had seen him and he ascended into heaven. And the disciples were probably wondering, now what? It's just us. But they remembered Jesus' words. He said, he said, wait until you're filled with power. He told them, don't do anything until you're filled with power and then you'll be my witnesses in Jerusalem and Judea and to Samaria and to the ends of the earth. And so they knew they had to wait and they had to pray. And so here they are, they're praying in Jerusalem, seeking God's help, and it had been days. And this is what happens, Acts chapter two. It says, when the day of Pentecost arrived, they were all together in one place, and suddenly they care, they, there came from heaven a sound like a mighty rushing wind, and it filled the entire house where they were sitting, and divided tongues as of fire appeared to them and rested on each one of them. And they were all filled with the Holy Spirit and began to speak in other tongues as the Spirit gave them utterance. Now there were dwelling in Jerusalem Jews, devout men from every nation under heaven, and at the sound of the multitude, and as the sound of the multitude came together, and they were bewildered because each one was hearing them speak in his own language. And they were amazed and astonished, saying, are not all these who are speaking Galileans? And how is it that we hear each of us in our own native tongue, Parthians, Medes, and Elamites, residents of Mesopotamia, Judea, Cappadocia, Pontus, and Asia, Phrygia, and Pamphylia, Egypt, and the parts of Libya beyond to Cyrene, and visitors from Rome, both Jews and proselytes, Cretans and Arabians. We hear them telling in our own tongues the mighty works of God. And all were amazed and perplexed, saying to one another, what does this mean? But others mocking said they are filled with new wine. In Acts chapter two, we see the beginning of the church empowered by the spirit. We see the followers of Jesus become what he had destined them to be. They were no longer just uh, 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 bewildered followers. Jesus, why are you gonna do that? Lord, we can't do this. Now they were gonna move from, from those who were, were on the sidelines to those that Jesus was gonna use in his place. And we see what, what is happening how do we understand this? I see fire. I mean, what's going on with the wind and, and these different languages? And I think what's happening is God is using Old Testament imagery to reveal to us what is really the truth in this, in this moment of history and now in this passage. And, and when we look to the Old Testament, what we see is that fire was always a symbol that God used of his presence. We see that when, when Moses... When, when he was wandering through the wilderness, leading his sheep, he, he came to probably a cave, and inside the cave, a voice came out. And, and when he peered inside, there was a bush that was on fire, but it wasn't consumed. And God spoke from the fire, the fire uh, representing the presence of God. And he spoke to him. And, and then as, as Moses would, would lead the Israelites out of Egypt into the promised land, and they're in the wilderness for 40 years, it says that, that, that God was before them at night by fire. And when, and when they, they came um, to Sinai and they began to build the tabernacle, and, and, and the, it was to be the dwelling place of God amongst the Israelites and really amongst the world, as they're building this tabernacle and they finish, it says that fire came down from heaven, rushing into the tabernacle, filled it. And as Solomon finished his temple, hundreds of years later, as they dedicated it, fire from heaven came like a rushing wind, filling the temple, representing that the presence of God was dwelling with them. Fire has always been a, a representation of God's presence. And as, and as these followers of Jesus, scared, uncertain, but trusting and searching, 
for the move of God in their lives. The next step, it says that as they were praying, fire came down, right? These tongues of fire rested over them and in the wind, the sound of a rushing wind filled the room telling us that now the presence of God no longer dwells in, in a temple, in a building, but it dwells within the believers as individuals and as a community. They had become the dwelling place of God. That word that we see in this passage for wind, as a rushing wind, in, in, the, in the Old Testament, but the Greek translation that Jesus probably would have read, as well as the disciples, that same word that's used for the wind in this passage is the word used for God's breath when he breathed into Adam. God is breathing his presence. He's, he, he's filling these believers with his spirit. God has rested on earth amongst his people. We have become the temple of God. And then they began to speak in different languages. In, in these, they were speaking in different languages, not to speak in other languages, but people from all these different nations were, were there in Jerusalem for this special feast. And they, what they were hearing was probably the gospel and, and the, the glory of God in, in Christ. As the disciples were filled with the Spirit, and it, what it makes me think of, and many scholars believe, is it's the, it's the fulfillment of the Tower of Babel. When, when, when humanity chose to forget God and make a name for themselves and, and do it their own way, God had to split them up because they could no longer be his people. And he split up them in their languages. And now we see in Acts chapter two is God is bringing back the nations, not just one people group, but the nations to be his temple, to be the place of his presence. God is restoring what was broken. We are the temple of God. Followers of Jesus have become the place where God dwells and interacts with the world. We have become many temples in one temple together where God reaches the world through our character and our witness of the gospel of Jesus. But the story doesn't end there. That's just the origin story. It continues. And, and, and what we see is the, the beginnings of the church and the, the troubles of the church. And, and we're gonna look in Galatians chapter five as, as Paul the apostle is going to speak about the spirit's relevance and his move and his need in the lives of believers. All right, so we're gonna jump to Acts, I'm sorry, Galatians chapter five. And Galatians is one of Paul's hardest letters where he is the toughest because the Galatians, these Christians, what happened was they had heard the gospel and believed in the gospel, that it's the work of Christ that has saved them and drawn them into new life. But now what's happening in this Galatian church is they are beginning to go back to their old ways, thinking that they needed the Old Testament rituals and law, the, the sacrifices and, and, and all of these different uh, things they had to obey in order to earn God's love, in order to earn their salvation. And so Paul is gonna be very direct as, as he deals with this, really this, this falling away. And he tells him in one passage, he says, are you gonna deny Christ by thinking you, basically you can earn God's love, deny what he did on that cross? And after he, he shows them the salvation of Christ, that it's only through the work of him that he has brought us freedom, exoneration from the law to new life, he, he now shows how that life is lived. In verse 16, this is what he says. But I say, walk by the spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Now the works of the flesh are evident, sexual immorality, impurity, sensuality, idolatry, sorcery, enmity, strife, jealousy, fits of anger, rivalries, dissensions, divisions, envy, drunkenness, orgies, and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. Verse 22, but the fruit of the spirit is love and joy and peace and patience and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness, self-control. Against such things there is no law. And those who belong to Christ 
have crucified the flesh with its passions and desires. If we live by the Spirit, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Let us not become conceited, provoking one another, envying one another. I want to jump right into verse 16 and walk through this passage. But it says, but I say, walk by the Spirit and you will not gratify the desires of the flesh. Have you ever been scared to go somewhere? Maybe the first day of school, the first day at a new job. Or you had to walk into a, a meeting. Or you had to walk somewhere and, and you knew it was going to be hard. Maybe you'd be the only person who didn't know anyone. Or, or you were going to need... To, to do something that you didn't know you had the strength to do. And you walked in alone and you felt bare. You felt like you had nothing. More than anything else, you would want to walk with a friend. I can remember the first couple of days of school. Uh, the first thing you do is you find your buddy. You find your friend, right? Especially when you're out of elementary school and you're going, you're going to middle school and high school where there's multiple classes and you got you to gotta go from one place to another. Now you got to find lots of friends in different places so that you're never alone because it's scary to walk in and see everyone talking and not know somebody. To be the one to initiate a conversation, it's scary. You need that person Let's go together. Maybe you don't hold their hand when you're walking to high school. That'd be weird. But you, you walk in together. You're there together. I love this image that we see in this passage. As, as we're walking in our lives, the, Paul, the image that Paul gives us is that, that the Spirit is walking with us. But not only does he, he, he say he's, he's there, where the Spirit is with us, but he uses this word by which is, a, which is a preposition telling us it's the means by which we do something. It's the way that something happens. There's a cause. And so I am able to walk in my life, Paul is saying, just in these first three words, I mean, six, seven words, because the Spirit is by me. I'm able to walk because of the Spirit. And he's going to break this down, okay? Verse 17 through 21. For the desires of the flesh are against the spirit, and the desires of the spirit are against the flesh. For these are opposed to each other, to keep you from doing the things you want to do. But if you are led by the spirit, you are not under the law. Right away, Paul is identifying that there is a war within us, that there is a battle that wages within our own hearts, within our own minds, something that is unseen to others. But... but and even as Christians, he's speaking to a Christian group here that, that they are battling in their minds the things that they ought not to do and the things that they should, the things they want to do and the things they know that they must do. And, and they are battling, waging war against the desires of the flesh. And, and, and he names them sexual morality and impurity and sensuality and idolatry and sorcery and enmity and strife and jealousy, fits of anger and rivalries and dissensions and divisions and envy and drunkenness and orgies and things like these. I warn you as I warned you before that those who do such things will not inherit the kingdom of God. There is a battle that we are facing, war that is raging, and, and, and we, we are hoping to do what God wants us to do, but we, we are unable in our own strength. And so he says, we walk by the Spirit. And what does it look like when you walk by the Spirit? Verse 22, the fruit of the Spirit is love and joy and peace and kindness and goodness and faithfulness, gentleness and self-control against such things. There is no law. And those who belong to Christ Jesus have crucified the flesh with its passions and its desires. He's called us to a different way of living. He's called us to a different way of thought. He's called us to wage war, but not on our own, but with the strength that only comes from a relationship with the presence of God, from an understanding that our hands aren't empty. We're holding his, that, that we're not bare. We're, we're protected. We're not following. We're not just following, but we've been sent that he walks with us. He walks before us, behind us, all around us. And how does this happen? How does this happen? How do we, how do we come to a place where we, 
depend on the spirit? Is there a trick to it? Is there a method? Is there, is there some kind of formula? Is, I, I love things that make sense, that are easy, that you can just tell me, do this, do this, and you have this. That's what I like, right? This passage doesn't necessarily do that because relationships aren't like that, right? Relationships are about time. Relationships are about dependence. Relationships are about communication, right? Walk by the Spirit. That's his answer. Live by the Spirit. Do we pray and call out to God? Do, do, do we visualize him with us? Do we say in our own hearts, I can't do it? Or do we try to say, yes, I can? Do we confess that we need him? Do, do, we, do we come before him and say, Jesus, I can't. I need your help. Do we make our own plans or do we rely on him for his? The fruit of the spirit. It's not just something that we do, but it's the result of something that's been done. Right? It's the fruit of the spirit. It's, think of fruit on a tree. Right? The fruit of the tree is the product of a healthy tree. Right? The fruit of our hearts is the product of what's in our hearts. And when we have the fruit of the spirits, it's because the, we, we are in tune and we are in relationship with the spirit. We, we, we are depending on him. We're visualizing him. We're, we're calling out to him. And we're beginning to do this right here. When he says, when you belong to Christ, you crucify the flesh with its passions and desires. If you, if you want the fruit of the spirit, you have to give something else up, right? The fruit really of the, of the flesh. And the only way really to, to do this is, is, is to not lock these things in, in the back of our minds, right? It's very easy to, to say, I'm just not gonna do that anymore, even though I, I actually do want to, right? I'm not, I'm not gonna do that more, but man, if nobody was around, that's what I wanna do. If... Jesus, I know, I know I'm trying to follow you, but I think that, man, that would have been so much better. Oh, no, look at the language that he uses. He says, crucify the desires of the flesh, right? He's not saying lock them up behind your mind, right? He's not saying, he's not saying just shove them to the side. He's using the most violent language you can. And think about it. He's telling you to not do all these bad things, right? And then he tells you to do all these amazing things that are great for other people, which is really uh, wrapped up in just loving others, right? And, and then he tells you to do this. Here's one more command that he gives, crucify. He doesn't get more violent than crucify. But he's saying in our outward lives to others, we, we love, we are patient, we are joyful, we are kind, we are gentle, we are self-controlled. But, but with the evil that's pushing war within us, we, we become violent and we crucify the desires of the flesh. We don't say, oh, man, I wish I could do that, but I'm not going to. No, we say, I hate that. I hate that evil. I hate what it's done to my family. I hate what it's done to my thoughts. I hate what it's done to my friends. I, I hate what it's done to my future. I, I crucify that. I'm killing that. That is going to die. Because... I don't walk with that anymore. I walk with the Spirit. Because I've become the temple of God's presence. Because he resides within me. And I love this verse, verse 25 and 26. If we live by the Spirit, if the Spirit is in us and we are depending on him, we're, we're speaking to him and praying to him, he, we're calling out to him, let us also keep in step with the Spirit. Amen. And then he, he defines it like this, verse 26, let us not become conceited, provoking one another, or envying one another. He gives us a list. And all of these different commands that he gives is identifying the way that we relate to others. Because when we walk by the Spirit and we are full of his presence. Not only does it change our thoughts and our actions and our, our space and our homes, but it, 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 chase, it changes the relationships that we're involved in all around. It doesn't just change your one life, it changes the lives that are involved in the community that you're a part of. It reshapes 
your world. It reshapes your friend groups, your church, your, 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 your families. It reshapes the world around us. The power of the Spirit moves, and it doesn't just change you. It changes your world, your community. And, and I was thinking of it like this, and I need, I need two volunteers. I need two volunteers. Who we got? All right. Let's get, let's get, come on up, you guys. You, I, Junior, Max, come on up. Come on up. Okay. All right. Thank you. All right. A little encouragement. You guys can stay down here, actually. Stay down here. You can stay down here. Okay. All right. I just need one of you right now, okay? So, and then one of you, we're going to, don't worry, you got a job. But you got to close your eyes. Oh, let's do, let's do Savannah. Close your eyes, okay? Now, what I need you to do is I need you to spin around like five times. Okay, be careful. Okay, very good. There you go. Okay, and now what I need you to do, Savannah, is I need you to, um, I need you to walk to uh, the back of the church, but the left side. I need you to walk to the back left door. But don't, you can't tell her yet, Junior. Don't worry, you have a job. All right, be careful, be careful. Keep your hands out. Make sure you don't hit nothing. Keep your eyes closed. <laughs> okay, okay, okay. All right, Savannah, that's perfect. That's perfect. Okay, thank you, thank you. It's troubled when, you, when, you, when your eyes are closed, you can't get where you need to be, right? You can open your eyes right now. Thank you. And, and when, when, when your eyes are closed, you, you, there's, no, there's no way you can get to your destination. And if you do get there, it's going to be a painful long way with zigzags and, and bruises. And, and you're not going to get there the way that you wanted to get there. And in the same in our lives, when, when, when we don't, when aren't being led by the Spirit, when our hand is not in His and we're not walking by the Spirit, life does feel like that. It feels dark. It feels unnavigable. It, it, it feels like, like there's no hope or, or, or there's, there's nothing that's going to bring us where we need to be. We feel alone and even lost. All right. Now what I need you to do is close your eyes, okay? Now I need jo- Junior, you keep your eyes open, okay? Come on over. I want you to lead her, okay? I want you to lead her to uh, all the way to over there. She doesn't even know where you're going. Yeah, all the way to that door over there, Okay? Go ahead, leader. Hold your hand. Okay. All right. There you go. Perfect. Okay. And you can even go a little faster, but be very safe. Go ahead. Okay. Yeah, yeah. Keep going, keep going, keep going, keep going. Look. Didn't hit one chair. That's perfect. Guys, can we give him a round of applause? Thank you. All right, thank you guys. Well done. You can open your eyes. But that's what it's like, isn't it? And maybe you haven't experienced that yet, but you're looking for that. When, it, when you feel like, how am I gonna get there? God, how, how, am I gonna, how am I gonna lead my family? Or Lord, how am I gonna speak about you? to those who don't know you, to the people I know. Lord, how am I going to deal with this loss? Lord, Lord, how, how am I going to change my ways? How am I going to do this? And we could bumble around with our, with our eyes closed, trying to do it in our own way. But when we begin to open up God's word and open up our hearts and begin to come to our knees, even when no one's looking. And we say, God, I need an encounter with you. Lord, I need your spirit to rest on me and never leave me. Lord, I need your, I need your voice to speak and compel my heart. God, I, 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 I need your thoughts to overwhelm my evil thoughts and kill them and draw me to the wisdom that can bring life. Lord, I need you to move. We need him, and he takes us by the hand, and he leads us if we allow him. Jesus said, 
If you ask for the Holy Spirit, just as a good father is willing to give a good gift, how much more is your heavenly father willing to give you the Holy Spirit? And he's not like a sixth sense, like he's not like a, like we mentioned, like a, a origin story of a hero movie. The difference is that he's not just some kind of superpower, right? He's a person. He's really our superhero. He's the one who, who walks with us and leads us, empowers us, speaks through us. In youth group, I've just been witnessing some kids just grow to know Jesus and really put their trust in him like I've never seen before. I've, seen, I've really been seeing a move of God um, in their lives that nobody could do on their own. It could only be done by Jesus. And, and one, one of the guys sticks out to my mind the most uh, right now in this moment. And I've seen him go from years ago just being a little interested and maybe coming here and, and not really even expecting something to happen to now having an encounter with Jesus and his whole life has changed. His whole mind set has changed. His, his hobbies have even changed. His friends have changed. He, he, he's, his thoughts and his motivations, even the goals of his life have changed. The way I've seen him deal with, with hardship has changed. I, I've seen him come and he, he comes and he prays for me. He, he comes and, and, and he brings people to tell them about Jesus. He comes and he prays over kids at the altar. Why? Because he's had an encounter with Jesus and he's been filled with his spirit. And he doesn't live in the past just remembering a moment of when God moved. He, he lives in the every day as he's listening with open ears for God's voice to speak, not even totally sure how it all happens yet. Saying, God, I just want to serve you. God, I just want to, I just want to walk with you. God, I just want to know with you. And I think that this is also happening in our church, and it's a product of the Holy Spirit. It's not a product of any one person. If we are growing in our love for God and our love for people, if, if we're growing in, 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 a, in a love to serve and to, to know him and a, a desire to follow him, that, that's the evidence of God in our lives. That's the evidence that the Spirit is moving. A year ago, I'm sure there were some of you here today who didn't even believe in Jesus. And now you might, you love him, you follow him. I'm sure of it that there are some here today who, who maybe didn't know if they could continue forward with Jesus. And there are here today people who have experienced the redemption in, 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 the, in the love of God that walks with them and moves them forward. I'm sure there are here today people who've experienced loss and tragedy. They, they thought God could not meet them in. And today, you know that he has met you and he has walked with you and he does care for you and he does speak with you and he has given you his presence. And then there are here today those who are struggling with those very things right now, hoping that there is possibility for the future. And I can tell you there is not because of any one person or just because of there's a building on this property. No, because the power God has met man. It's the Holy Spirit who, who speaks to us and leads us and compels us and changes us and molds us and heals us and, and, and guides us. His presence is with us. The friend that we always wanted to, to walk us through our first day of school walks us through our every day of life. He's here. And within this, there, there is a temptation to, to just look around and observe what God is doing and, and not think that it's for you. But it's for every single one of us. The power of the Spirit is for every single one of us. And he wants to lead and guide. He wants to enter into your world. Not so that you can just do something amazing. Something amazing will happen, there's no doubt. But so that you will, you will know the presence of God because that's always been the goal. 
If something amazing happens, it's only so that more people can come to know the presence of God. He wants to know you. He wants to lead you. He wants to do something amazing in your life, maybe through even the hardest of circumstances. And then there's another temptation. That temptation is to get so involved in the work of the Spirit and what he calls you to do, to, to, to get your hands so busy that you forget it's about meeting with God as we meet with others and drawing others to know him. The Galatians lost their way because they got so involved in the works of trying to earn their salvation, they forgot it was just about knowing and serving and loving and, and, and walking with Jesus and what he has done for us, not what he, they could do for him. We need to spend time in his presence and with one another to experience not just the work of the Holy Spirit, but the presence and the love and the being with the Holy Spirit. When you get home from school and you're tired and your parents ask you to do chores, your natural desire is going to be to shrug it off. I know because I was them. I was that. And, and to just do your own thing, to play your games or to, to go and, and to whatever's on your heart. But the tug of the Holy Spirit in the everyday and the littlest of things is to move you in love, to move you in patience, to move you in self-control, to be there and do what you don't want to do. When someone says something rude or, or mean to you, your natural desire is going to be to talk about them behind their back or to create a space in your heart where, where you, you hate them. Uh, but the work of the Spirit, the nudging of the Spirit, the compelling of the Spirit that you're not going to always like, but the crucifixion of the flesh is going to go and to forgive that person, to speak to that person, to find common ground with that person, or simply to not hold something against that person. When you're tired from work and, and, and there's chores to do or there's more things that you need to get done and your kids might want to spend time with you and, and, and it's going to be tempting to just tune out and do your own thing and, and just, I got to do my thing. To make a memory, to get an ice cream, to, to, to go play with them, to, to speak to them, to hear about their day because the Spirit is working in you, patience and self-control and gentleness when you're in an argument and you're trying to defend something that you did was wrong even, and you're trying to do it without admitting your fault, to humble yourself, to ask forgiveness, to allow the spirit to be the hero of your story and not yourself. When someone frustrates you and is inconsiderate, to not disregard them, but to still value them. When you feel overwhelmed and lost, and the spirit begins to bring peace and patience and faithfulness because he walks with you and he guides you through seasons of brokenness. It's impossible. We can't do it. And I'm just gonna invite the worship team up. We need the move of his spirit. We need him in our everyday because we can't take a step forward unless he steps with us. I wanna see love and I wanna see joy and I want to see patience and faithfulness and goodness and gentleness and self-control. But those things don't happen unless I come and I say, God, I want freedom. Freedom from trying to do things myself. Freedom from trying to follow just rules. Freedom from trying to make my own way. I want freedom that's only found in trusting in the work of Jesus that he did what I could not do. And that he did it in my place so he could promise me his presence. Not just for a memory that I once had where God met me, but that I can walk every day knowing I walk with the Lord. That he's changing my thoughts. He's changing my way of being. I need the spirit. I was thinking as fall is here, and as we see these leaves, they begin to fall. All summer, those branches held to them so strong. There's storms, right? Different places where there's hurricanes, through hurricanes, through, through all of these different things. The, these leaves hold. They hold to, to, these, to these branches. But in the fall, as the wind blows, it begins to push these leaves just right off the branches. And I know in my own heart, there's been times where I've held on to the desires of my flesh. I've, I've held on to doing things in my own strength. I've held on like a leaf. Oh, I can do it. 
And then in a moment, when I meet with the Spirit, He begins to move me like a fall breeze, and He pushes me where He needs me to go. I want to be movable in the Spirit and unshakable from His presence. He wants to do that in our hearts and in our lives. Let's pray together. Father, we come before you. And Lord, we need you. We need your move, Lord. We need your move in our families. We need your move in our, in our jobs. We need your move in our own thoughts where we battle. Lord, we need, we need your movement, Lord, in our emotions. Lord, we need your movement in, in, our, in our everyday, God. When nobody's looking, when everyone's looking, Lord, we need you. Because, Lord, at times it feels like we're lost and our eyes are closed and we're bumping around and, and, and we feel like there's no forward, there's no movement forward, there's no way. But, God, you walk with us. You promised us your presence and that you would never leave us. You give us new vision, God. You give us new perspective, Lord. You give us hope, Lord. You give us willing hearts. Mold us and shape us, Lord. Walk with us. We need your spirit. Bless your people, God. Bless your people, Jesus. In your mighty name, amen.